All right, just so you know, the session is being recorded. It is also being uh, streamed live on Facebook as well. So welcome everyone. For those of you who are new to the workshops, uh, this is kind of the flow. Uh, we will go through some quick intros. We'll dive into presentations and then there'll be Q&A uh, throughout the presentation, but we'll have some time at the end as well. And we'll wrap up at 7.30 sharp. Uh, in the meantime, <clears throat> while I'm going through my intros, feel free to start thinking about your intros as well. Uh, I do typically leave a 30 second window for everyone to do their own intros or community announcements. So if you have any events, any uh, upcoming workshops, anything interesting that you want to share, feel free to take this time to share it with the audience. Uh, you can simply use it to just introduce yourself or if you, you know, if you're looking for a job or if you're looking to hire someone, you can announce those kind of things as well. Uh, otherwise, let's get right to it. <clears throat> oh, I've break magic. Yeah, I've been doing this for some of my workshops, not all. Uh, so yeah, maybe I think we can do it for this one. We have some time. So let's try this. Uh, one of the recent ones that I was playing around with. So if you all want to follow with me, you can feel free to turn on your video as well. I'd love to be able to see all of you do it. No worries if you have shy faces, but feel free to try it out as I go along as well. So I want you to do this. The OK sign, three fingers up. Put it over your eye. And I want to see if you can follow along with me. So I'm going to flip my hand. Oh, Mike could do it, yeah. Can anyone else do it? Or is anyone having trouble doing it? So I'll show again. I think Mike got it, yeah. <laughs> Great. So I'm not sure how many people were trying to do it, how many people got it. <clears throat> but the uh, quick trick to it is a lot of people are wondering, like, how do I do it? I can't flip it. Uh, and if you notice, the easy way of doing it is a lot of people, like when I first tried to do it, I'm like, Wait, how, how do you bend your hand up like that? Uh, all you do is you bring your three fingers down. So if you have your okay, you bring your three fingers down and basically you flip. So once your fingers are down, you flip your hand up and then just open up your fingers again. So it takes some practice if you are new to it, but that's basically how you do it. Great, so let's jump to it. Uh, so with my workshops that I like to run, uh, I always believe that there's no such thing as a one-size-fits-all. Every business is different, every customer is different, every product is different. So if you have some insights that work well for your business, if you have stories, I'd love to hear your stories. I think they always make the best examples. So feel free to you know, come up mute or type it in the chat uh, if you have any comments as well. Uh, another thing I try to do with my uh, workshops is uh, I try to create an inclusive and welcoming environment. So if you hear anyone coming up mute, uh, if English is not your first language, do bear with them. Uh, do feel free to call people out on anything as well. So if you see someone uh, behaving inappropriately, or if you see someone is actually beating around the bush for certain things, just you know be respectful, but do call them out. So I think otherwise, uh, that's it for housekeeping. Uh, for the rest of experience, I typically recommend, of course, that you try not to multitask during the presentation, uh, but I can control that. So I'll only say that much. But otherwise, I hope you enjoy today's session. This is one of my favorite workshops. I've done it quite a few times. And I really love uh, going into and analyzing different businesses and looking at how I can kind of help with improving revenue. So these are some of the lessons um, that I have. But before we jump into that, uh, community announcements. So like I mentioned, 30 seconds. Uh, anyone can come up mute. Anyone can share in the chat. It's going to be much quicker if you come up mute. If you have anything upcoming, any upcoming programs, workshops, uh, if you saw an event that's interesting that you want to share with the group, uh, this is kind of time to, to sh share that. Anyone want to announce anything? Good to see you, Inle. Do you have something to announce with one of your programs? Um, hi. Hi, everyone. <laughs> yeah. um, 
Yes, uh, so I've got a couple of things coming up. And um, so my um, business name is The Idea Shaper and I help with young professionals, um, people in their 20s and 30s um, who wants to start their own business projects or side projects, um, navigate their strengths and skills and actually um, start navigating and exploring new project ideas. So I've got a workshop um, coming up Friday, um, Friday Vancouver time. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, let me know if anyone's interested. It's for two and a half hours. Um, so we are going to brainstorm um, potential ideas for your projects and that can be within your current career or outside and you'll come up with a few ideas that you'll be exploring afterwards. Okay, thanks for sharing. Uh, feel free to share any links that you have in the chat as well. Uh, anyone else want to come up mute? You can use this time to, to do an intro as well. Right, going once, going twice. If not, I will move on. Great, so a bit about myself. Uh, my name is Chin, I'm your host today. Um, I run this company called Classy Nowell, and the mission of the company is basically to help improve and change education to incorporate more elements around soft skills. Uh, and when I talk about soft skills, these are things like not only public speaking, but also how to negotiate, uh, personal awareness, mindfulness, uh, and really just helping people in general understand more about themselves and their values. Um, my background and why I hope I'm a good speaker for the topic today is uh, I spent the last five years working out of the Social Venture Incubator Accelerator in Vancouver. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with the term, it's basically a business consultant. Uh, and I was working a lot with startups. These are early stage entrepreneurs that are at the idea stage, true to when they're starting to raise money to scale. And these were social ventures that I worked with. So what the social venture is, is basically it's a for-profit business that cares about uh, some element of uh, doing good so be it environment, community, or health, or social justice, things like that. Uh, so yeah, I've been working with uh, companies for the last five years, probably worked with close to about 400 companies or so. Uh, and my area of focus was primarily around helping them with sales and growth. So hopefully um, I get to share a lot of great stories with you in terms of what some of the companies have been doing, uh, how they've implemented some advice and you know, seen some growth. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I, I still believe I'm very much a learner of life as well, and I'm not the most experienced person in the room. so. Always looking forward to learning from all of you as well. So uh, some key areas of focus for today's workshop. I want to talk a bit about growth engines. So for those, those of you who have read the Lean Startup by Eric Ries, you might have uh, seen this uh, terminology. But I'll go a bit more into detail and talk about how it's best, uh, how different engines are best for different businesses. We'll go into ideas around how to increase revenue. And then we will do some troubleshooting around your revenue challenges as well. I'll give you some ideas around where to start, how to analyze, and also uh, how to actually go about making some, some changes to improve your revenue and income. So first off, uh, I wanted to start by talking about engines of growth because I think every business has a specific engine that works best for them. So what I mean by that is, uh, as I talk and show you the three different engines, do know that you don't have to focus on only one. You can run a business that has multiple engines but generally what you will find is there will be one or another that tends to skew more heavily for your business depending on the type of business that you run. So the three engines are paid, viral, and sticky. So paid in essence is basically uh, the, the traditional engine of growth. You're doing a lot of marketing, it's spend, so ad spend, product placement, you know, visual merchandising, uh, all of this fall under the category of paid. Uh, and paid is basically you're buying your customers as you grow. Uh, viral relies on word of mouth. So viral here is not about uh, creating viral content that people will share. It's more about how you generate an engine where people are constantly referring more and more people to your product or service. Uh, so what I want to bring to your attention over here is uh, a lot of businesses will typically have some form of a paid engine and almost every business will also try to have a, a viral engine. Some people will I mean, I haven't seen any business that doesn't try to rely on referrals. But uh, there are certain businesses that paid engines don't work very well for. So typically I see this in service, in consulting, uh, in membership programs, anything that is very experiential focus. 
So if you have a business where it's really hard to articulate your value proposition of your solution uh, in an ad, for example, because people can't visualize the experience unless you go through it. So like life coaching programs, like landmark forums, you know, Tony Robbins and his program, these type of things rely very heavily on uh, viral and word of mouth. So if you have that type of business, I would recommend that you focus more on the viral aspect and we can talk a bit about some ideas around how to, to build a viral campaign as well. Uh, and you don't have to worry as much about the paid side of things. It's not going to give you as much of a return than if you were, were to focus on the viral side of things. Um, when you think about viral as well, it's not only the campaigns that you run, but you can also build virality into your product itself. So Dropbox is a great example of that. So if you look at how Dropbox was set up in the early days, they actually had a system where every user that came on board, if you refer a friend, you would get extra space, your friend would get extra space as well. So it's not just campaign, but it's actually built into the product offering itself. So you can think about different ways to design your product or solution to encourage more virality too. Uh, and the sticky engine of growth is primarily focused on retention. So the idea over here is uh, not only keeping people around, but you want to actually have positive net retention. So there is a negative churn. So for example, you can see on the left side here, what you're seeing is uh, every month you are having a, a fixed amount of retention. But what you will notice is if you are not adding more or growing your user base, eventually your customers will still plateau out. So you'll get uh, or reach a flat area of growth. Uh, negative churn, what that actually means is you're keeping people around, but you're also upselling them. So you might be upselling them, you might be getting them to upgrade to uh, you know, a premium account, you might be selling them add-ons, cross-selling them. So you're not only just keeping the same amount of people, but you're actually increasing the value of your customer as well over time. So that's the idea behind the sticky engine of growth. Uh, and like I mentioned, remember, you can have all three engines in play for your business but there will be one or another that you will tend to focus more on depending on your product or service. Uh, quickly to look back as well, on the paid engine of growth, uh, it tends to work best for consumer products. It tends to work best for um, B2C rather than B2B. Um, B2B, typically more viral heavy as well uh, and sticky heavy as well. So account management, uh, you have your account managers, um, customer service, customer support. That's why you, you tend to see these more in, uh, business centric uh, businesses. Uh, so maybe let's talk a bit about viral. I mentioned that I'll give you some ideas around how to do it. So there's this great book. Uh, it's called Contagious by Jonah Breger. 100% recommended. It's one of my favorite books in marketing. Uh, and in Contagious, he talks about how to create viral campaigns and viral products. So there's a framework that he analyzes and notices in almost every campaign and product that has some element of virality. Uh, and the framework the acronym for it is STEPS, S-T-E-P-P-S. So STEPS, what it stands for is people will want to share something that you have when there is some uh, social currency. So that's the first S. So what social currency means is when I'm sharing something, it makes me, the sharer, look good or feel good. So for example, I like to brag about an uh, interesting place that I went hiking because it makes me look like I'm an amazing person who discovered this new and undiscovered place, right? So what uh, can you give to your user to motivate them to look good as the person sharing? So there are some ideas around that. So I'll, I'll go into examples in a bit, but let, let me go through all of the steps first. So that's social currency, making the share look good. Uh, T is triggers. Social sh currency gets people sharing, but triggers keep people sharing. So how do you keep your product or service top of mind? How do you keep people rem, uh, reminded about your, your product or service? So you're just asking, what's the title of the book? Contagious. Um, I think the full title is Contagious, How Products Go Viral, something like that. Uh, and the author is Jonah Berger. So Contagious Jonah. I think I got the spelling right. Um, so T is for triggers, uh, and I'll go into some examples. Uh, e is for emotions. So what emotions can you invoke? And then uh, the first P is public. The second P is practical use. And then the last S is stories. So let's talk about some examples. Uh, so first off, I think uh, one of the examples that he gives for um, uh, social currency is he talks about how people like to brag about certain things. And one of the restaurants, for example, he gives one a restaurant where it's based in New York. And I think it's a, it's a speakeasy. 
So it's like uh, you go into a restaurant, they sell hot dogs and stuff, and then you go to the back, there's a phone booth, and then you dial a special code on the phone booth and it opens up to a hidden bar. So super cool. So people like to share about it. And if you see the way that they actually market is they actually don't advertise that hidden bar. But when you go there and you get a drink at the hidden bar, they give you a um, uh, kind of business card and the business card says, please don't tell. And that's actually the name of the speakeasy. So it's deliberate in such a way, it's designed in such a way so that people will actually want to tell other people about it. Uh, so that's kind of how they design it to have that element of social currency. Triggers, uh, one of the examples he gives is um, Alka-Seltzer. So Alka-Seltzer is a, uh, a like a, a pill. Um, it was pretty popular back in the days, and I think it was used for uh, upset stomachs. So if you have indigestion, uh, an upset stomach, basically you pop in a pill, and then it will help deal with your stomach acid, something like that. Um, and one of their campaigns that they did is they use a trigger in their ad where instead of using a single pop, they went plop, plop, then your, your stomach pain will go away. And the idea is by actually having that trigger, people think plop, plop, that means they actually need two pills instead of one pill to actually double their sales. So that's one of the examples they gave. Another great one is if you look at Kit Kat, Kit Kat, they associate themselves with taking a break. So every time you go on a break, you think of Kit Kat, right? Uh, so good triggers are typically triggers that are not uh, already associated with something else. Uh, but at the same time, it's something that happens in close proximity to your product service. So what I mean by that is um, uh, one example would be, let's say uh, KitKat break normally is the, the vending machine for the KitKat is near the coffee machine, right? So that's why it's in close proximity to the trigger itself. Uh, if it's in uh, distant proximity, it's not as effective. So for example, if you go to a grocery store and you forget that you need to bring your recycling to recyclable grocery bags, uh, one of the triggers is if you get to the store, it's already too late. So you might want to initiate a trigger earlier in the, in the, in the journey, maybe when you could grab your car keys, right? So maybe you might put your recyclable grocery bags in your car keys. So that's uh, an example of triggers. Uh, emotions, what he talks about is your key area of focus is you want to focus on emotions that are arousing, not emotions that are calming. So people tend to focus on positive versus negative emotions instead. That's not the right way to think of it because there are positive emotions like contentment that don't encourage sharing. Instead, if you focus on emotions that are uh, even arousing that are negative, like complaining, frustration, those people, like people love to share about uh, bad experiences as well. So you can get people to, to talk more or share more when you actually focus on those negative emotions uh, that are, as long as it's arousing. So calming would be on the other hand, uh, depressing or contentment, those kind of things uh, don't tend to increase sharing as much. Uh, this is also why you see typically ads that are uh, in Super Bowl, for example, in sports, they happen during halftime when people's emotions are supercharged, right? Uh, public, public. what he talks about is he gives some examples around um, products or campaigns where they go viral because you can visually see them. And these are best done for concepts that are uh, not typically visible. So for example, uh, Ice Bucket Challenge. The Alice Buc Ice Bucket Challenge became so viral because the act of donating to a cause is typically something that's private. People don't share it. But by actually creating a visual element, pouring ice on yourself, nominating people, that actually had, creates that viral momentum as well. So how can you create something that's a bit more public, like uh, Movember, right? Growing up your mustache, things like that. Uh, and then practical use instead is very similar to social currency. Uh, it's not focused on the sharer, but it's focused on the receiver. How can you give the receiver something of value? So people will want to share if they know that this will benefit whoever they're sharing it with. Uh, so the tips around there would be, you want to make it as specific as possible. People typically struggle to share because they don't know who to share it with. So if you have a blog post on how to shop for shoes, that might be too broad. But if you say how to shop for shoes for ballerinas, then I might be, oh, I know a ballerina, right? So make it specific. Uh, so that is the, the piece on um, practicality. And then stories, how do you tie the right stories to your product or services? It's not just uh, a stunt, a publicity stunt. Publicity stunts get attention, but if you don't tie a strong story to it, people will forget about your product or service. So they would just remember the stunt for the stunt itself, but they remember the brand that's associated to it. So some of the good ones include, um, if you look at Lush, they have the beauty campaign, which is focused around uh, body, positive, body positivity. Uh, but if you look at some of the bad ones, that might include things like, um, I don't know if anyone has ever seen the Evian Roller Baby videos, 
where they have like this video of babies roller skating around. Like I have no idea what the hell the video is about. <clears throat> um, but basically it's advertising for uh, like a mineral water company. Yeah. So I hope some of those tips uh, help you out. Uh, but maybe let's quickly move on. So back to the topic of increasing revenue. So I, I just wanted to share the, the growth engine just to make sure that you understand which engine works best for you. But let's dive into how to increase revenue. So there are really only four ways to increase your revenue. And if you can think of any other way of increasing revenue, it will actually fall under one of these four. I haven't seen anyone that does not. Uh, and it actually comes from the book, The Personal MBA by Josh Kaufman. And the four ways are, number one, increase the number of customers that you have, obviously. Uh, number two, increase average transaction size, get them to buy more when they do buy. Number three is get them to buy more often, frequency of transactions. And number four is to raise your prices. So let's go into each of this in detail so that you can actually see how you can be creative with some of them. So increasing number of customers. Uh, some of the different ideas behind that that fall into this category include uh, testing your channels for better quality leads. So maybe you might find that uh, you're currently promoting on Facebook ads, but maybe Facebook is not the right place to reach your customers. Maybe it's uh, going to conferences. Maybe it's uh, running workshops, right? Testing different channels. Uh, number two, expanding a target market. So maybe you might be selling to North Americans, but maybe there's another target market out there that will help you out. Uh, one example over here that I typically see is, uh, especially if you have seasonal products, uh, a good thing uh, that you can do is you can sell to the Southern Hemisphere uh, during the off seasons. So for example, if you have a product that's popular in the summer in North America, summer is going to be the December time uh, in places like Australia, you know, South Africa, things like that. So exploring different target markets, uh, leveraging referrals, uh, thought leadership, content, those are all ideas and ways that you can explore increasing the number of customers. Um, so maybe we'll take a quick break, do a quick exercise. I want you to look at some of your current channels and I want you to think about what other channels you can try exploring that you haven't already tested out. Maybe I'll give you a quick two minutes to do this. All right. Uh, anyone want to share? Come with me, talk about your business, talk about what channels you're currently using and what channels you have yet to explore or want to try explore. No takers. What I recommend is um, if, if you really struggle with coming out with ideas, one of the best ways to uh, explore different channels is to share your business with someone that, you, uh, that does not know your industry. Because generally, they will typically give you very different ideas in terms of what channels to look at. Uh, and they might be channels that you might never have thought of as well. So one thing that I've uh, found personally quite valuable is um, being in a mastermind group with other entrepreneurs where we actually share ideas, we brainstorm different topics and we talk about different opportunities and challenges. And I've gotten a lot of great examples and ideas out of that. So maybe I won't go into that if no one wants to give an example, but that's one thing you can try exploring if you're looking for more ideas and solutions around different channels that you can try. So moving on. Um, yeah. Oh, someone wants to say, Jerry? Uh, yeah, I would like to try. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I am from Seattle. 
Uh, I'm actually an MBA uh, student uh, at Porsche mm -hmm. School of Business of University of Washington. Mm -hmm. So in the last quarter, I helped mm -hmm. uh, an art museum uh, to kind of like, help them to increase the traffic and increase the revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and the museum has like, only a very limited budget. So what we come up with uh, to recommend to the museum is to use the um, um, social media channel and after we do a baseline research on uh, like what kind of social media platform the museum is using mm -hmm. uh, we figure like maybe a Facebook is a good um, uh, start point because they have been posting a lot of like their posts uh, their photos and videos on Facebook and there are a lot of followers uh, of their page and later on, we find out like Facebook has a lot of like marketing tools to help small and uh, uh, middle business to do marketing on their platforms. Mm -hmm. And they also should come with the um, analytic tools. So we recommend this to um, the museum. And they have been struggled because they are not familiar with the digital marketing um, mm -hmm. like, uh, tools. Uh, so we just come up with very basic uh, to do like, uh, increase the frequency you post your apps or like your your articles so that people uh, get more attention pay more attention to your to your pages mm -hmm. and we also recommend uh, they add the call to action um, button on uh, the like Facebook post or on the newsletter because like, we want the uh, audience to come to the museum so but in the past their like marketing material, the museum uh, did not like encourage people to come. Yeah. So sometimes it's just a very uh, simple action, like you you cut, uh, like you you ask for it, then people will just do it. Then yeah. that's uh, I think like uh, they are going to have a because it's the pandemic, so we did not see the result yet. Yeah. Uh, we hope our recommendation will help. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for sharing. That's a that's a great and interesting examples. Uh, if I were to give some additional ideas as well, um, what you can try to suggest to them. Uh, around social media is uh, they can experiment with creating communities. So what I mean by that is normally a lot of brands, if you look at how they engage on Facebook, uh, by default, they start with their, their brand page. Uh, so one idea is uh, I find that the strongest brands are usually very community driven. So they're more about a cause. So for example, if uh, let's say you had a science world instead of a museum, or maybe even a museum, you can still do this as well. But let's say with science world, you would maybe share um, different experiments that you can do at home. And that will get people excited and get people interested in science, right? And, and you encourage people to actually share their own experiments and share their results and share their videos. Then it builds more community. So that's another way to engage people so that maybe when the pandemic is over, uh, these people are already your audience, they're already engaged and they are more interested in coming in to check out some of your, your offerings. So that's one idea as well. Great. Thank you. Hi, my name is Natalia and I have uh, started business consulting business. Mm -hmm. And um, I use only networking at this moment, and I just started to do LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Um, I haven't generated any leads yet, and I know that I'm at the beginning of my journey. Yep. Um, but I was hoping uh, maybe you have the statistics or you know exactly. I know, well, I doubt you. Uh, probably it's individual, um, but what? Which are the best business B two B? as channels yeah great question uh Na natalia yep yeah great um <clears throat> i would say that your business business consulting similar to mine actually falls very closely into the category of um like i mentioned more on the viral side of things so for example if you use uh instagram instagram is very visual mm. you will usually find that instagram is really difficult to get your type of audience especially businesses uh to kind of notice your content because people on Instagram are typically just browsing visual images. Like it's great for products, uh, consumer, it's great for tourism, it's great for food. It's not usually very good for like consulting businesses. So um, instead, what you might want to be doing is exploring channels like what I'm doing, where you're doing uh, and building thought leadership. So it might be webinars, it might be conferences, it might be speaking engagements. That's probably where you can get the most bang for your buck. Uh, so that's my suggestion there. Oh, thank you very much yeah. thank you yeah linkedin could could also be good if you do it the right way uh, but it depends on whether or not you can reach the right people if you're good at uh, identifying the right decision so, yeah 
Um, I also started to do the videos about uh, business management consulting, like how to optimize a business, a little bit of what KPI is, how, mm -hmm. like uh, how to make uh, your emails go faster or like work, make your business better. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, it's, it's probably more about the web, like um, uh, online presence, like web presence than generating the leads. At this moment, I'm not generating the leads, yep. but I'm still trying to figure it out about the channels. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no problem. Good luck with that. Thank you, Payne. Uh, anyone else want to go or we can move on? Well, I have a quick question. Like, yeah, by the way. Cool, so um, in terms of, um, well, we talked about LinkedIn and does anyone have um, experience like using LinkedIn or I guess other um, channels as well to do um, outbound sales or are you going to cover this topic later on? Uh, I actually covered that in a different workshop, um, not this one, but I can lightly touch on it. Um, so LinkedIn, there is, you can do it for marketing where you're just posting and promoting posts. But outbound sales is where you're actually finding your right prospects, finding their contact info, finding the right person. Uh, maybe I can quickly share my screen so you can possibly see that as well. Uh, quick second, I'm just going to share the screen. Let me get out of that. So let's take a quick look over here. So LinkedIn, uh, and I was actually just doing it with this one company. So I'll just quickly show you how I do it. I won't go into too much detail because I run another workshop for that. Uh, but this morning I was trying to look up Salt Spring Coffee. So I'm actually running a hackathon in October and I'm trying to look for retail businesses that are interested in looking for new innovation and new solutions. So the first thing you do on LinkedIn is you search the company name. You can see all the employees on LinkedIn and you can see uh, over here, the CEO or founder is Mikey McLeod. And you can use an email tool like hunter.io and it will actually help you guess the email address of the person at the company. So you put in your website into hunter.io. And you can see over here, it shows you the format of the email. So over here, uh, it says first name at saucemeatcoffee.com. It actually shows you Mikey's email here. So Mikey at saucemeatcoffee.com. And it actually shows you where it's listed as well. So that's how I do outbound prospecting and build my list. And then, uh, of course, crafting the email is a whole different story. I have a whole different workshop on how to do good copy and have good conversion. But I won't go into that. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thanks so much. Great. All right, let's move on. Uh, do, do, do. So next uh, point is, so number one, I talked about getting more customers. Number two is getting them to buy more. So getting them to buy more, these are some different ideas. So one, obviously, upselling. Two, cross-selling. The difference between upselling and cross-selling, if you're not familiar with both of them, is upselling is you're selling a more expensive variant. So for example, if someone's buying a car, you might upsell them to an SUV, right? You might upsell them to a sportier version of the car, a higher trim level. Uh, cross-selling is where you're selling similar products, you're selling accessories. You might say, hey, you bought a car, maybe you want uh, floor mats, maybe you want uh, you know, roof rails, things like that. So all of those are cross-sells. Uh, other things that help increase your average transaction size is the more time they spend on your website or in your store. Uh, bundles, so if you can offer bundling, you might say, hey, you know what, maybe you don't want to get this, but if you have all of this together, it's this one package, it's this price. Uh, free shipping thresholds, you see that with a lot of companies, you see that with Amazon as well, they might say, uh, with a minimum $50 purchase in your cart, you get free shipping, right? So that increase, uh, that encourages you to spend more. Another version of uh, using this kind of bulk ordering is discounts on minimum purchase. You might say, oh, you get to you know, spend 20% off if you buy five items, 25% uh, off if you buy six items, something like that. So volume discounts, all of those are different ways of increasing your transaction size. Uh, what I generally find is normally when I talk about cross-selling and upselling, uh, especially when I'm training sales reps, a lot of them feel very uncomfortable with the concept. And I think all this discomfort typically happens for two reasons. So one is they feel like they're really pushing a, a prospect to buy a product. And once the, product has, the, the, the prospect has committed to, to buying the product, they feel like it's another 
level to get them to say yes to something else again. So they tend to be afraid to actually make the ask. Uh, I encourage them to really just think about shifting their mindset. Uh, because uh, the second point is they are trying to do a cross on upsell because they feel that it is in it for them for more profits, for more revenue. You should always think about the customer first. Upselling and cross selling is for the benefit of the customer, not for your benefit. So your goal should be, how can you help your customer win? So the example over here is like, you know, let's say if you're doing a hotel, you might say, would you like to add breakfast for two? Normally $49 to your room for this 29, right? It's a win-win-win situation. It's better for the customer because it's cheaper, more convenient, more value. So you're trying to come at it from that perspective. How are you going to help your customer get more value? Uh, when's the best time to upsell or cross-sell? I typically look at a milestone. So what a milestone means is when a customer has experienced some level of positive positivity. So one milestone is of course when they commit to buying your product because then they've really clicked, they really see the value in it. Another milestone is after they've started using your product or service. So for example, I think Natalia was talking about doing consulting. So maybe after one or two sessions, when a customer sees that there's good value, then that might be a good opportunity for them to be upsold to maybe a more detailed consulting package or something else. Uh, so what, what is that aha moment that they get after they start using your service? That's probably a good time to position for an upsell or cross sell. Point number three, increasing frequency of transactions. Uh, it's really all about recurring revenue. How can you get people to come back over and over again? So uh, recurring revenue is one, uh, building a habit in your product or service. So another book, if I want to throw one at you, is um, Hooked, H-O-O-K-E-D. Uh, so that's one book. That's another one. Uh, I think it's a power of habits. Um, but I can, I'll send it all in a summary email later. Uh, but basically, these are different ways to engineer your solutions to create more habit-forming solutions. So the idea is you're thinking about what's the trigger, uh, what are the reinforcing behaviors, what are the rewards they, that they get coming out of it, uh, and what you know gets them to actually come back over and over again. So the more you can stay top of mind, the more likely they are to come back to, uh, to you. And this might even require that you not only do a campaign, but actually shift how you're running your business. So one great story here in Vancouver is um, there was this company called Push Operations. They're still in operations here in Vancouver. Uh, they do accounting software. And they focus on the hospitality industry. So hotels, uh, restaurants. Uh, and when they were actually giving this story, they were talking about how they started with accounting software and they eventually noticed that they had to transition into payroll software because accounting is something that happens once a year. It's not top of mind, right? People think about it once a year when they're doing their taxes and then, you know, come next tax season, they'll look for other options again. But payroll happens on a biweekly or even monthly basis. People are thinking about paying their employees almost every month. So if it's, something that they're using more frequently, they're less likely to switch away to a competitor, but it's also top of mind for the customer so that they think about, you know, upselling to, um, for upgrading to more features if they need more features, right? Uh, another common model is you see the printer and cartridge model where printers are cheap, but then the refills are the, the thing that gives them more recurring revenue. Uh, you see that with SaaS companies where there's some sort of, uh, you know, monthly subscription, you see it with, uh, contractors or consultants where they have retainers, uh, retaining packages, things like that. And the idea is really how can you get your customer to invest in the relationship. Uh, loyalty programs are another great way of this for more physical products. So if you have a restaurant, if you're in grocery, so that's why you see like, um, uh, I don't know if Walmart does it, but Costco, you have your membership card, they track your spend, that's how they know if you're coming back, right? Uh, you have certain places where you get, I, I don't know in the US, but here in Canada, let's save on more and you get points every time you shop and you can use those points towards credits and they can you know, discount your next purchase. Uh, so that's another thing around loyalty. Uh, Airbnb, Airbnb, they, when you refer a friend, your friend gets credit, you get credit as well. They're not giving you cash. They're giving you credit so that you come back and spend with them again, right? So that's all the idea around how to increase that frequency of transaction. How do you get them to come back and buy again? So credits, I mean, you might think you're giving your customer free money, but usually they're purchasing more than the credit anyways. Uh, maybe before I go into pricing, any questions about these two points, average transaction size and frequency of transaction? No? Um, 
um sorry it's me again natalia sure. um please uh i probably have missed this part uh stay top of mind um stay top of mind yeah. uh yeah so like i mentioned the story of push operations like if you're doing something where your customers think about your product service more often that's where you're top of mind like how can you get them to uh you know if you're doing let's say consulting in your case uh, mm -hmm. instead of having monthly checkpoints actually monthly is actually really pretty good uh, but if you do a, a project-based consulting where it's like one time and then done how can you turn it into more of a monthly project where you break down goals you have them uh, hit different milestones and then you kind of work with them as they grow um, in a software as a solution basis uh, instead of getting people to buy one year up front you might give them monthly subscription and then they they get to see the that they're actually paying for your service more often as well. Uh, push operations, they focus on payroll, which was bi-weekly or monthly, instead of accounting, which was once a year. Mm. Gotcha, thank you. Hi, Chen. Hey. Um, invest in the relationship, in what way to invest in the relationship? Maybe my customers, if I keep in touch with them, I, I give them free info, then they like me, then I can sell more of whatever I'm selling. Is, is that what that means? Uh, sort of. It really depends on the business that you're running and the type of solution or service. Um, let me think of some examples. So, I, so for example, when I was in retail, so I used to work in telecommunications. I used to sell phones uh, at, a, at a phone dealership. And what I would do with some of my customers is I would actually get them to come in and I would give them tutorials and show them how to use your phones, especially with the older customers. So that's an example of investing in relationship because I know that they come back, they, you know, enjoy that great customer experience and they'll actually bring their family members along to upgrade all of their phones as well. So that's one example. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Great. Uh, let's talk about pricing quickly. Pricing sounds very straightforward. Obviously the more money you charge, the more money you get. But there's also a scientific and strategic way to find the optimal pricing. Uh, so what you want to look at when you raise prices is you want to look at two things. You look at cost of acquisition, so CAC for short, or LTV, which is the lifetime value of your customer. These are two things that you need to keep a very, very close eye on as you test your pricing because when you increase price, it will make it harder for you to acquire customers, i.e. your cost of acquisition will go up. And there's a possibility that your customers will churn out, i.e. leave your company, leave your product or solution more quickly, therefore bringing down lifetime value of your product or service. So uh, one great example here and another story is uh, this lady here is Dr. Alexander Greenhill. She runs this company, My Best Helper. And My Best Helper is a platform that connects nannies with um, parents who need care for their children. So if you need a babysitter that you go on the platform, they match you up with a babysitter. So when they started the platform, they used to charge nannies $10 a month to be on the platform. And then they eventually experimented and tested and increased their price. So when they were charging uh, babysitters $10 per month to use their platform to get jobs, uh, they noticed that babysitters would stay on the platform for an average of about six months. So if you think about it, six months times $10 lifetime value of the customer is 60 bucks, right? They increased the price all the way to $80 a month. And they found that $80 a month was the sweet spot. And I'll go into why. But $80 a month, they found that the, yes, the babysitters only stayed on the platform for an average of three months instead of six months. So higher churn, they leave more quickly. But if you think about it, $80 times three months is $240 per customer as opposed to $60 per customer. So the lifetime value of the customer is still much higher despite the higher churn. Of course, that's why I mentioned cost of acquisition as well. They found that anything over $80, it increased this uh, CAC too much and it made it too difficult for them to acquire customers. So that's kind of where they found the sweet spot. So your, your goal as you test pricing is you want to chart and measure what is the cost of acquisition, how is it changing, and also churn. How quickly are customers leaving? How long are they staying? So those are two things that you want to keep, pay attention to because it will affect the lifetime value of the customer. Make sense here? So hopefully if you chart it out in a graph, you should be able to find like what is that equilibrium point, the point where you can make the most money, uh, where it's actually going to make sense for your business. 
of course, th these are experiments that I would say would come later in the stage. If your business is still early along, don't worry too much about this. Focus more on getting customers first before optimizing pricing. Uh, oh, saying initial pricing, since some of you might be startups here, this is a common question that I always get as well. Uh, the biggest mistake I often see when people are setting initial pricing is that they price based on cost rather than price based on value. So an example here is uh, I was working with a uh, event recycling company in Vancouver and what they were doing is every time they had customers, they would service uh, events and music festivals and what they would do is the event might say, hey, we need you to come in and have recyclable bins, and we want you to man this bin so that people can sort their trash and put it in the right recycling containers. Uh, and what they would do is they would ask for a quote, they would ask for things like, how long is your event? How many attendees do you have? And then they would base their estimation based on that. And what they found is for certain events, let's say if you have a concert, and the concert is three hours long, and 200 attendees, and you have another concert that is say three hours long, but 600 attendees. So triple the volume. When they were pricing their quotes, they noticed that uh, when for the 200 person event versus the 600 person event, the cost was not much difference because the amount of people that they would have located in the venue would not be that much more. It would not be three times more. And the people that were at the venue were still there for the same three hour window. So their costs would not scale with the event. So they found that, yes, they were getting bigger clients, but they were not bringing in more revenue. So I encourage them to shift their pricing more on the value side of things. And what they were doing then is they were pricing based on number of attendees, and that really helped them kind of get out of that uh, growth kind of uh, roadblock that they had. Uh, so price based on value rather than cost, that's the first thing to talk about. Uh, so when you think about value, how can you, what are you saving for the customer? How much money are you saving them? How much profit are you helping them make? and how much time you're helping them save. So these are just some rough estimates that you can start with. If you're helping them save money, you can probably charge them anywhere from 10 to 15% of their annual savings. Uh, if you're helping them make more money, you can probably charge 10 to 25% of whatever additional income that you're bringing in. Uh, if you're helping them save time, it's a bit harder. You need to try to identify what is the missed opportunity or, or what they could be doing instead or what their time is worth, right? So hope that gives you some idea around setting initial pricing. So maybe let's do a, a quick pop quiz. Um, but I think, Natalia, do you have a question? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I'm very interested in the setting the cost to price based on mm. value. I agree as well. Um, but I was wondering, um, how do you charge annual savings? Um, are you doing rough estimates at the end of the project? Are you like? Uh, or are you doing 100% advance payments? Or are you, how do you charge for profit? Would the client agree on that before seeing two numbers? Yeah, so uh, in the consulting world, profit is usually quite straightforward. So that's uh, where you could do something like a revenue share agreement, where you say, um, you know, maybe instead of charging based on a project, you might say, uh, we will split profits 80-20, uh, for example, for the next two years or whatever it is. So that's one way of uh, you know, taking a slice of the profit. Uh, savings is a bit different. It really depends on what you're doing. So on the savings side of things, for example, um, let's take, uh, say, Zapier as an example. Well, Zapier saves time and money. Uh, but Zapier, for example, uh, if they could compare themselves, they might say, uh, if you were paying for a marketing solution like HubSpot, which is quite expensive, you might be paying $600, $600 a month, depending on how many contacts you have. But with Zapier, you can do the same level of automation and workflow, but it's only going to cost you maybe about you know, 70 bucks a month. So yeah. in that sense, then they can see, okay, I'm saving like over $500 a month. That helps me picture how much I'm willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Got it. Thank you. Very useful. Thank you. Yeah. Again, th these are ballpark numbers. It really depends on your product or service. Mm -hmm. So maybe I want to give some examples so to see if you can kind of, if you grasp the concept pretty well. So this one you see, uh, Ikea, Ikea, I don't know how you say it, depending on where you're from, uh, but Ikea has restaurants. What do you think this falls under? Which of the four? Getting more customers, getting people to buy more, getting people to buy more frequently, or getting people to um, increasing pricing. 
which of the fathers is torn. Can we choose more than one pillar? Absolutely. Getting people to buy more? Oh, are we supposed to put in the chat? Uh, doesn't matter. You can speak or chat. Uh, David saying two or three. Yeah. Getting people to buy more. So that's uh, that would be two. Yeah. Yeah. So if you guess two or three, I think you're spot on. Uh, I would say the main one is two. <clears throat> so increasing average order size, getting people to stay in the location for a longer period of time, they're more likely to spend more as well. If you notice how IKEA is designed as well, it's a freaking maze, right? They pretty much make you walk through the whole damn store before you can get out. That's why the more time you spend in the store, the more you'll, you'll buy as well. Uh, it does also <clears throat> increase frequency of visits because I, I notice myself, I sometimes visit IKEA just to go to the restaurant and now I end up shopping a bit as well. Um, but what it does not do, it's, it's actually not a revenue generated by itself. The restaurant is just at cost. They're not making money off the food. If you notice, the food is like dirt cheap over there, right? They're not making extra money from that. It's not an upsell, uh, but it is really about getting people to spend more time, buy more products, and also a bit more. Uh, oh, I think I gave this one, so that's a giveaway. Uh, printers used to be really, really expensive. Now they're actually pretty damn cheap, and sometimes it's 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 terrible for the environment, but. I've actually seen cases where it's cheaper for me to buy a new printer than to refill my ink. <laughs> that's terrible. Um, but yes, increasing frequency of transactions. So that's where you go. Uh, any other questions on these revenue ideas? And then maybe we can talk about how to um, identify some problems with revenues and overcome some challenges. I'm gonna quickly chat, check the Facebook Live. I just have a comment, like rather than a question. Yeah. So, um, in terms of your customers, I also found it important um, to factor in um, whether your customers have been how much knowledge they have, um, or if they have previous experience getting your type of offering or services before because then that sets some sort of an idea what they will get out of it and also like an anchor point for pricing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, definitely agree. Cool. Any other comments, questions? All right, let's move on to the last part. <clears throat> so troubleshooting revenue problems. This will work best for uh, when you already have a business that's up and running. Uh, if you don't, of course, no worries. This is something that you will visit, revisit in the future. Uh, but the idea is generally most revenue problems stem from one of the three. So number one, I need more customers. Number two, I'm struggling with closing customers. Number three is it, it's taking me too long to close my customers. So those are typically the three most common problems. Uh, in other words, they, they call it BOPO or FOMO. So top of funnel or bottom of funnel. Or, or TOMO or whatever. Well, top of funnel, bottom of funnel problems. So need more leads, top of funnel, trouble closing leads and long sales cycle, that's uh, the length of the funnel and also the bottom of the funnel. So if you are struggling with getting more customers, there are a few experiments that you can try. So number one is uh, you might be using the wrong channel. So obviously test different marketing channels, but you might actually be using the right channels, but using the wrong language or the wrong copy. So that's where you can also test the different wording, test different descriptions. Uh, one of my favorite examples here was, I think there was this one company, I don't remember for the life of me which company it was, but uh, they were selling uh, some sort of environmental friendly product. And what they were doing with uh, ads is they at first were targeting their Facebook ads for people who are uh, liking similar types of environmentally friendly products and would share that they are in this type of environmentally friendly groups and whatnot. But they noticed that by just changing a simple targeting thing, they were targeting Tesla drivers and they were actually getting a lot higher uh, sales and revenues because Tesla drivers also seem to care about the environment but also have the money to spend as well. So small tweaks like that can all help you unlock really big things. So testing different channels, also just testing the wording of it. Uh, sometimes if you're not on the marketing side of things, it might be 
uh, that you're not making sales a priority. So it happens the most with uh, technical founders or founders that are uh, consultants, I find. So you see a lot of consultants where you have what we call a cyclical sales cycle. You get really busy, you work with the clients, you don't do any sales, and then suddenly you realize, oh my God, next month I have no new customers, I have no sales. Then you spend the whole month doing sales and you don't have any customers. And then again, suddenly you get all these customers coming in and then you don't have time to do sales. So the idea here is you want to make sales a priority. You want to make it a habit, build it into your daily schedule. Make sure that every single day you're spending some amount of time on some sales related activity so that you don't end up in that kind of up and down cycle of business. Uh, this might also be an opportunity to explore different growth models that I mentioned. Maybe paid is not the best channel for you. Maybe it's viral, maybe sticky, whatever it is. How can you adjust uh, to improve? Uh, reduce funnel leaking is another idea. So if you are struggling with getting leads, you want to make sure that you get the most out of your existing leads. So funnel leak, what that means is, uh, let's say I'll give you an example funnel. So an example funnel might look like uh, if someone views a Facebook ad. From the ad, they go to a website or landing page that where they register for a webinar. From the webinar, they attend the webinar. After the webinar, they jump on a consultation session or demo, and then they buy a product or service. Right? So that's an example funnel. So a leak might be, uh, there might be some people who view the ad, they click on the website, but they don't sign up for your webinar. Or they might sign up for the webinar, but they don't attend the webinar, right? So there's some leakage. And your idea is you want to make sure that you recapture these people, uh, and the idea is you can target them. So if you know that someone has clicked on the ad, you can serve them other ads. Or if you know that someone has visited your website, uh, it's stored in your cache, in your cookies, right? So that's how you actually target them. That's why you notice when you visit a company's website like Nike or Lululemon, suddenly you see the ads all over the place everywhere you go. So that's the idea behind retargeting. Uh, if they you know, miss your webinar or, or don't attend, that's where you might send them an email saying, oh, I have another session coming up. Uh, or you might send them a recording and the idea is to get them to come back. Right? So those are some ideas. Uh, if you have trouble closing leads, so that's, um, where possibly this could be some of the, the problems that are causing it. So one is you might have the wrong target audience, therefore you're struggling to close them. Or they might not be qualified leads. So um, maybe I can quickly talk about SQLs and MQLs here. So SQL stands for sales qualified lead and MQL stands for marketing qualified lead. Uh, so sales and marketing need to work very closely hand in hand. If you don't do that well, then you get this disconnect where sometimes uh, leads are passed off to sales when they're actually not qualified. Uh, so a qualified lead, for example, could be, let's say if someone has exhibited sales specific behavior, like they've visited your pricing page, or maybe we know that someone has attended uh, three or more of your events, they're likely to convert into becoming a customer, then you want to reach out to them. So if you're not qualifying them the right way and you reach out to them too early, you might actually need to nurture them a bit more with marketing, with like, content, you know, videos, podcasts, whatever it is, before you actually really engage in sales. So don't waste time selling them if they're not really good. Or it might just be poor sales reps. So if you yourself or the people that you're working with don't have good technique, you're rushing into the sales, you're not asking for the sale, uh, you're bad at overcoming objections, these could all be different causes. So that's where you want to start to look and explore. Uh, and then the last one is long sales cycle. So a long sales cycle is where you're typically finding it takes too long. And, and normally I find this a lot with B2B companies. Uh, I would say in a nutshell, no sales cycle should be more than three months. <laughs> I know it's a very big claim for me to make. Uh, I've seen some entrepreneurs say, oh, like, hell no, Chin, like, that's impossible. I sell to hospitals. I sell to universities. Like, it takes me a year for me to close a customer. Uh, there are ways that you can adjust some of those things to close the customers more quickly. Optimally, your sales cycle should be less than three months. Uh, and I'll give you some ideas in a second, but maybe I want to talk about some other things first. So first thing is, uh, one problem I often see is when reps don't set clear next steps. So you might jump on a demo call or you might you know, have a consultation session and then you don't book in the next call. So one of my favorite experiences uh, recently was I actually recently switched my car. So what happened was my lease was ending and the dealership called me and they said, hey, we noticed your lease ending. Uh, do you want to come in and take a look at uh, new cars? And I said, sure, I'm, I'm open to checking it out. He could have just hung up. But he actually said, hey, are you free this weekend? So he's setting that clear next step for me, right? So he's driving to get me to come in this coming weekend. 
So therefore I ended up coming in, I actually started shopping around. So that's the idea there. You want to set clear next steps. Uh, band, that stands for budget, authority, need, and time. Uh, and the idea around that is you need to qualify your customers the right way because if you have too many people in uh, your funnel <clears throat> and they're not ready to buy yet, even if they're qualified sales, sales leads, you're wasting your time with them. So for example, uh, maybe they don't have the budget yet right now. They have to wait till the next month for the budget cycle or next quarter, right? Uh, maybe they don't have the authority. They need to speak to their manager. So maybe you're reaching up to the wrong level. Uh, maybe they have or don't have the need. So you need to qualify them to make sure that they actually see the problem. And then timeline as well. So for example, um, uh, if you sell to government or if you sell to businesses, uh, most businesses you might notice that yeah, fiscal year is usually in January or maybe in um, March or April. If that's the case, then you want to try to hit them either as the new year rolls in, as they have new budget allocated, or right before, <clears throat> right before their fiscal year end because they need to spend and exhaust their budget so that they can get the new budget. Make sense? Uh, so that's uh, band. Uh, so some of the examples here, I, I mentioned I was going to talk about um, formality. So one great way and one example that I've seen with how a consultant does his uh, contracts is instead of sitting people down, giving them a contract and getting them to agree on something, what he will do is he will invite people in to a brainstorming session in person. Uh, it used to be in person, I don't know how he does it now. But basically he would do it on a whiteboard session. He would basically brainstorm the, the, the challenge that they have, the opportunities, and he'll come up with solutions on the fly. And at the end of the session, he'll take a picture of the whiteboard and he'll say, here's our MOU. This is the memorandum of understanding. This is how we will start and this is how we'll try to help you. So instead of having a contract, it becomes a bit less formal. It's a, a lot more tangible and people feel like they can start and get to work with that right away, right? Uh, one of my other favorite examples, I was working with this company that was selling uh, internship software. So what they would do is they would sell it to hospitals and it helps the hospitals manage all of the uh, student interns. And you might think, oh my God, these are the two worst customers to work with. Hospitals are really big bureaucratic and students, student interns, you're working with the university, it's also very bureaucratic. Uh, initially, he found that his sales cycle was usually at least a year long. He would need to sign agreements, get the universities to agree, get the hospitals to agree. And then I actually uh, did some mystery shopping with him. We pretended to be a potential customer and we called up one of his competitors. And we found out that his competitor was actually, uh, they were offering the solution to the hospitals to try out for free. They were not sending any contracts over. Uh, so they had like free trial, the customer could test it out, uh, the hospital could test it out. And then once uh, the trial period ex uh, expired, uh, I don't remember if it was time-based or volume-based, but the idea is once it expired, they would have to upgrade or pay more to get more, to manage more student interns on the platform. And, all the legal stuff that was in the terms and conditions of the platform as opposed to in a contract. So then that shortened your sales cycle down to, I think it was 14 days as opposed to a whole damn year, right? So if you're involving too much legality, once the legal department gets involved, you're definitely gonna guarantee yourself a longer sales cycle. So how can you kind of make it less formal? Um, another great, great example. Sorry, I have so many examples. Uh, Traction On Demand is a Vancouver-based company. Uh, what they do is they help companies with implementing CRM. So CRM is a customer relationship uh, management tool and they specifically focus on Salesforce implementation. And to implement a CRM tool in your company is a really big decision because companies have to retrain their staff. People need to be compliant, use the CRM to really get the most out of it. Uh, they need to make notes on their customer's account. They need to uh, understand how to use it. There is cost associated with it. They need to integrate their tech with it. They need tech department. Sorry, I'm going on a bit, but basically it's a big decision. So what they would do is instead of selling the actual implementation, they would actually sell a mini version. So they would go to clients and they'd say, hey, you know what? For $5,000, we will generate a report for you. We'll come in, we'll assess your business. We'll help you determine the best CRM tool for you. It might not be Salesforce, it might be some other ones. We'll give you a comprehensive list of all the different CRM tools and you can decide which one you want to use and whether or not you want to implement it yourself or work with us to implement it. And this mini offering of yes, $5,000 was low cost enough that they, that meet the budget for the decision maker. They didn't have to escalate that to like finance department or get the CEO involved. Right? 
So that, that uh, is kind of the thin edge of the wedge. How do you get your customer to work with you first? Uh, because they found that 80% of people, once they got the report, they would actually work with them to actually implement the solution. So that's kind of the idea around how can you get your foot in the door? How can you change not only uh, what you're offering, but actually your actual solution itself as well? Uh, free trials is another thing to be careful about. When I talk about trials is try to stay away from uh, time-based trials. So if you say, hey, 30 day free trial, congratulations, you now have a 30 day sales cycle. <laughs> so uh, instead of using uh, time-based free trials, which guarantees you that sales cycle, uh, you want to tier based on um, features or volume. So a great one that I have is, uh, I've been using this tool, it's called Yet Another Mail Merge. And it allows you to send emails in bulk through your Gmail, through your inbox, uh, without using a client like MailChimp and whatnot. And how they have set it up is you can send 25 free emails a day. <laughs> if you need to send more than 25, which is most of the time, you need to upgrade right away. So their sales cycle with me is like five minutes because I use it. I send a few emails and I realize, yeah, this tool works great, but I can only send 25. I need more. I upgrade, right? So if you use volume-based tiering, you get people to upgrade right away because they can start to see the features. Uh, contracts, I talked about that. And yeah, I think that's pretty much it. A lot of different ideas today. So I think I'm going to stop there. I want to make sure you all have enough time to digest all of that. Um, but in a nutshell, I'm going to sum it up. You want to get more people to buy more, to buy more frequently, and at the right price. So that in a nutshell, that single sentence is all you're doing to optimize revenue, right? Of course, be creative, test, and, and iterate. Uh, and, and don't be afraid to actually adjust not only your techniques or what you're offering, but your actual product or service itself. Like I mentioned, sometimes you might have to escalate this to your CEO or whoever's higher above you, but you want to make sure that uh, you have the freedom to test and experiment because sales reps are the ones who really understand the customers the best. Uh, so yeah, uh, one last thing is, of course, if you're going to fix anything, if you're going to start by optimizing, always focus on the top of funnel place. It doesn't matter if you have the, the best landing page that will get everyone to sign up for your webinar if no one's even clicking on your app to get to your landing page. Again, right? So I think that is basically it. Uh, some upcoming workshops, I run a whole bunch of stuff, like I mentioned, soft skill related. Not all of them are sales related. Uh, there's one next week where I have a dietitian coming in to talk about diets and food. Uh, I have one on purpose and value discovery coming up. Uh, we have one on non-manipulative sales techniques. Uh, one on negotiating a raise and promotion. Uh, that's actually with uh, head of HR for CTO.io. Uh, and we have list building, sales automation, and sales suits coming up as well. So full list of workshops on our Eventbrite. Um, but yeah, I think that is pretty much it. Uh, I sometimes get some questions around how to work with me. Do you guys want me to take some time to talk about that or we'll solve that? Uh, I think Jerry's okay with that. So uh, I'll quickly go into that. Uh, I promise won't be a lengthy sales pitch, but basically I, I do have this program called the Startup Sales Academy. It is designed more for startups, uh, but if you are a sales rep, this is probably something that will be valuable for you as long as you have the opportunity to, like I mentioned, adjust some of the strategy as well. Uh, but if you're in a company where your boss just tells you what to do, then unfortunately this will not give you as much value. Um, and this program is actually about a month long. It is quite an intensive program. Uh, it happens on the weekdays. So Tuesday, Thursdays, uh, typically 6 to 9 p.m. Uh, I'm running the next cohort in October. Uh, and basically what I cover through the program is uh, there's about five, four to five hours a week on content and about another two or three hours for assignments. Uh, it's around things like, you know, some of the tough stuff we talked about, revenue engines, uh, growth engines, revenue models, uh, building sales experiments, testing pricing. We go into strategy a bit more. So we talk about funnels, how to build them, uh, tools and automations, list building, uh, sales goals and metrics, copywriting. Uh, I go into techniques, you know, how to pitch, how to overcome objections, uh, how to negotiate. Um, yeah, basically it's a pretty comprehensive program. So that's the program in a nutshell. If you're interested in learning more, I will share the link in the chat. But otherwise, uh, that is it for the presentation. So this is my contact info. I'll leave it on the screen. And now I can open the floor for any Q&A.
We have till 7.30, so we have 15 minutes. Hi, Chen. Do you have any company that hit on all major points you presented tonight? Do you have like an example, like maybe Google or Facebook, they so successful, they hit on um, major points that they generate value on a continuous um, month purposes and they always like Amazon they we invent themselves used to be we only buy books and and they are small and then mm -hmm. now huge because mm -hmm. they invented themselves like in so many ways is really eye-opener yeah uh, great question and I think I want to be a bit careful with how I answer this because uh, knowing these concepts when you look back at some things in hindsight you always see everything in play it's what we call confirmation bias, right? If we believe in these concepts, we tend to see them in play. Uh, but let's say if we look at Amazon as an example, uh, Amazon has the free shipping threshold. So that is an example of how they're using, uh, you know, increasing average order size. Uh, they have Prime, which is subscription. So that's frequency of purchase, getting people to pay on a regular monthly basis, getting them to think, oh, I have my Prime account, I need to use it. Or I'm wasting the money that I'm subscribing for it, right? Uh, so that's another example there. Um, upselling and cross-selling, uh, their model is a bit different. So they are they have multi-sided marketplace. They have direct consumer. They also make money through the merchants themselves. So that's where it's a little bit different. Uh, pricing, I'm sure they do a lot to optimize pricing. I, I'm not too sure exactly because I haven't worked with Amazon directly. Um, so yeah, I can't quite comment on how they tested the best pricing. Um, getting more customers, acquisition channels. Uh, I don't know how they do that specifically, but for, I'm sure they have many, many different ways of doing that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, every company is different depending on you know what solution, what market you speak to. Yeah. On your summary slide, um, what, what are the third and the fourth points um, yeah, third and four points, buy more oh. frequently, and then optimal pricing. Um, Getting people, more people to buy more. The more people is the, the testing the channels, testing different markets, buying more is increasing average order size. More frequently is um, frequency of transaction, and optimal price is, uh, yeah basically looking at cost acquisition and life and value. Yes, I remember I went to a marketing class and they, they were very successful in, in reinventing image for uh, various companies. I remember there was an example about uh, this car cleaning company in Europe and he used to be selling 150 package $150 uh, uh, for car cleaning package and he was struggling with sales and then he hired this uh, marketing firm we invent the image and presented them as the number one uh, uh, company uh, uh, for water like waterless no water uh, mm -hmm. cleaning surface it's the number one is the most economic uh, uh, most green mm -hmm. way of cleaning your car and they charge two thousand mm -hmm. dollars for each surface and they were doing well so yeah it's an eye-opener yeah somehow you we invent your image and you position yourself as the expert you you offer something unique no one else offer and you can charge a much bigger price, uh, yeah. price point yeah sometimes it might be as drastic as that uh, i wish it was as easy for every single business <laughs> But I think it really depends. Like in some cases, some businesses don't have that flexibility. Uh, so sometimes it might just be a small campaign. Like I, I talked about um, the internship management platform. All they did was just really change how they were shifting the contract. Instead of doing a contract upfront, they basically shift to uh, getting people to do free trials, test out the platform, and have all of the legal stuff in the terms and conditions of the platform. And that changed their sales cycle from a year to about 14 days, right? So. Different experiments, different concepts will affect different things. Um, I wish it was as simple as like, oh, they did this one single thing and it hit on all of the points. 
not always the case. Okay. Yes, thank you. May I ask something? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, um, thanks for the presentation, by the way. Um, very informative. Um, so I, I like the idea of uh, testing and iterating and um, experimenting. And I know that that requires um, uh, diligence ex uh, and uh, time mm -hmm. and patience. And then, so let's say you're, you're, um, you're short on time, you're watching kids. Yep. Um, how do you know you are wasting your time? How do you know, <laughs> how do you know you're, which, how much time, how, how long do you keep going on an experiment? Yep. And I guess the second part of this is what if it's sort of um, affecting your reputation or accidentally offending maybe like former clients? <laughs> Great question. Uh, and that question speaks to me a lot because I am uh, recently self-employed as well. So I recently moved into doing this business uh, in January this year. Uh, I also have kids. So I'm also in a situation where my family does depend on me. Um, so maybe let us try to break that down in a few pieces. Uh, so one is a lot of experiments sometimes don't see the light of day or, or don't see success, not because uh, they are done incorrectly, but sometimes just because there's not enough time given uh, for it to actually work out, to actually play out, right? Um, so I would say, first off, when you think about experiments, number one is uh, generally what I find with most entrepreneurs that succeed, and I think succeed is uh, quite arbitrary depends on you. But in general, when you're doing some of these experiments, you're not doing random stuff. You're not just throwing shit on the wall and seeing what sticks. Uh, a good experiment is an experiment that still aligns with the mission of the company. So in business, they have this term called a pivot. They're trying and testing different things. Uh, so I'll give you an example. For me, when I started my business, the mission has always been the same. It's always focused on education. But when I started, uh, I actually started classing what I actually used to be called value hired. And it was a hiring platform where companies could go up and list jobs, but instead of listing jobs, they would actually talk about their causes, their mission. And I, my, my assumption was that that will attract people who care more about the company and that will give them people who are better aligned in terms of values and mission. Uh, and that will be a better fit as a candidate. And then they would, you know, after that screen for skills and qualifications. Um, and of course, a lot of those assumptions were false. Uh, companies don't actually, they say they care about value, they say they care about mission, but they don't quite recruit the same way. Uh, so then I, I made a pivot. I adjusted to it going directly to education. So that's one of the experiments that I did. Um, but the mission is still the same. So I'm still going towards the same destination. I'm just taking an alternate route, uh, route to it. I'm not going directly to the companies. I'm just going directly to education instead. Uh, and if you're wondering why did I decide to go after companies to begin with, uh, that was because my assumption was that if I change how the marketplace was hiring, uh, that would change how education was designing programs. Uh, and I thought that would be an easier way to do it because education was quite bureaucratic. So I thought, hey, if I go after companies, uh, they, would, they would be more nimble and hopefully you know, they would pressure educational institutions to adjust uh, their program. Uh, so that's one uh, experiment, for example. The other thing to think about is uh, when you think about experimentation, uh, like I mentioned, you want to start with top of funnel experiments always first and foremost. If you don't have enough volume, it doesn't matter how great or amazing your, your landing pages are, your conversions are, if you just can't get enough customers. So how can you get more customers? Always start with those experiments first. Uh, test with volume. How can you get more people? How can you get more subscribers? Uh, you know, more registrations, whatever it is. Uh, and then as you map some of those out, uh, the other thing to consider as well is statistical versus directional significance. So I, I don't know if that's a word I coined up myself, but basically statistical significance, uh, we know that in science, uh, there's a specific formula and structure on how to do statistically significant analysis. But oftentimes we don't have the right sample size, especially if we are running a small business. So your goal in the early stages is more on directional significance. You just want to have a rough idea to understand, like, are you trying the right things? Are you doing the right offerings? So some examples that I'll give is uh, testing out my workshops. So some of these workshops that you see right now, uh, they are actually, I think you get the sense that it feels pretty polished. But when I started, it was nowhere near this polish. Uh, when I started, I, I tested by testing different subject lines. I tested with different content. 
I tested with uh, even different ways of selling the tickets. So originally the tickets I would actually, I tested free tickets, I tested uh, price tickets. Uh, now I do by donation. I test different wording for the donation as well. It used to just be free and donate. Now it's free or buy me some diapers for my kid. And I'm just trying to test and see if I get better conversions for, for different things like that. So I'm doing micro experiments, but uh, some of it is not statistically significant, but it just gives me an idea. If I'm starting to notice some trends, uh, it helps me kind of move or sail in the right direction following the wind. Um, so not the best answer, but I hope that kind of gives you uh, some, some rough idea of how to start. Awesome. Yeah, that's very, very liberating advice, especially for um, top of funnel, because sometimes I kind of feel trapped with having a large network that are kind of warm. You know, they're, they're aware, but not shopping yet mm -hmm. and actually generally interested. Mm -hmm. And then I don't want to be like a clown and switch everything up on them. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Okay. So um, thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. I asked a quick follow-up question on that, um, Chen. Yeah. So, um, how when do you know like your marketing qualified lead um, are ready to be turned into sales qualified lead? Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, maybe I'll share my screen quickly show you something. Um, so I have this sales map or template. Uh, it's something that I give out in my course, but I'll quickly show you how it looks like. And this is how I, I chart people in my funnel and also design different call to actions and, and content as well. Give it a second, it's loading. All right, I'm clicking too quickly. Give me a second. <laughs> hey, it's not loading. I have no patience for tech. Uh, there you go. Are you saying something about your actual view is outside of King Park? Oh, your animation, yes, virtual background. <laughs> Happy ocean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great, uh, I think you can see my screen now. So let me pull this up. So this is what I call a sales or marketing map. Uh, it's designed under the foundation of, um, if you look at HubSpot, they have this framework called in the inbound marketing framework. Uh, and the, the main stages of the funnel that they use, it's, it's not a, what I call a process driven funnel. It's designed around the user journey. So what you see over here is stages would be awareness, consideration, decision, and close. And what those stages mean is awareness is your customer needs to first become aware of the problem. Consideration is they need to start looking for solutions. Uh, and if you notice here, problem, awareness of problem and consideration, they're not even thinking about you yet. You only come into the picture when you get into the decision stage, when they are looking for specific solutions. And then closing is that that's when you, they actually buy a product or service. So an example is, let's say if I take HubSpot as an example, HubSpot is a CRM tool, uh, awareness of problem might be, people might not even know what inbound marketing is to start. So what is inbound marketing? So they might create specific content, specific uh, videos, blogs that teach you about inbound marketing. And then when they are moving their candidate to a consideration stage, so this is where MQL comes into play. So if, for example, if I'm creating content about what is inbound marketing, if I know someone has read this blog, that blog, uh, watch this video, then maybe I say, okay, they're ready to move on to the next piece of content so that they are a marketing qualified view. So the next piece of content might be, uh, now that you know inbound marketing, let me show you how to do email marketing. Let me show you how to find a CRM tool. Right? So then they, they start getting to the specific uh, solutions. And then decision then is, let's say if you are talking about email marketing, now you, are, now you know how to do email marketing, you need to look at different email marketing tools. 
So MailChimp, ActiveCampaign, and then of course they'll say HubSpot is one of the options as well. So that's how they position themselves amongst the competitor. And then once people are shopping around for the solution, if they if you see that oh someone has exhibited behavior, they've consumed that content on email marketing and they are actually looking at email marketing tools, then that's where you shift from marketing to sales. Or if maybe the client has, like I said, mentioned, uh, visited the pricing page, or maybe if they've attended uh, X amount of workshops, that number really all depends on your product and service. Um, for example, in education, I noticed that typically with my programs, if someone has attended three or more of my workshops, they're usually ready to move on to the program. Uh, and yeah, so that's how you kind of set up what you define as your SQL trigger. And then closing is just basically, you know, once they're ready to close, you're, you're talking about terms, um, you know, return guarantees, things like that, payment plans, payment programs, yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah it's, that's right, thank you. Yeah, so, yeah, like I guess it depends on the business, like what kind of, um, points or markers that you want to see and then identify. And I guess it'll like change as you develop your business as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, thank you. Yeah, sorry. I, I don't mean to like pitch my angle as a consultant, but I, I find that most businesses are all different. So it's really hard to do a one size fits all and say, hey, just use this framework and it'll work. That's why with my clients, I tend to actually have to customize my solution with them and really work and understand their business to give them the right kind of you know, strategy of mine. Mm. Chen, uh, with technology, with the internet happening happening in this uh, 21st century, uh, like 10 years ago, internet not that uh, popular uh, in the household, but now it's like almost every household has internet uh, connection. And mm. with, with the Technology nowadays with the uh, smartphone and uh, smart home, uh, you think it's easier for like you sales consultant um, to to be easier to be successful than before, or is getting more competitive is actually more difficult? What's your view? Good point. Uh, a bit of both. Um, so yes, it has made it easier to reach customers and work with customers. Uh, I do find that, especially in the consulting space, because uh, it is more experiential, people like to work with consultants in person more than virtual. Um, it does give us a, a broader reach. So for example, I myself, I've been working with companies in Vietnam. Uh, I've been working with companies over in, um, I think I had some folks in Jordan as well. Uh, so it has given me a larger reach. Um, but of course, same, I am, it is a bit more competitive. Uh, they are open to shopping around for other consultants as well because now everyone is virtual. Uh, so pros and cons, yeah. Sorry, again, no, no easy answer there. <laughs> Bit of both. Yes, yes, that, that is true. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Otherwise, it is uh, 7.30, so I do want to be mindful of time. I think we can wrap it up if there's no other questions. Thank you so much, Chen. Yeah, really no enjoyed problem. it. Glad you enjoyed it. This is one of my favorite workshops, so I always love talking about it. All right, have a good evening, everyone. Thank I'm you. going to end the session. Yeah, any questions, just shoot me an email. I'll put my email in the chat as well. Thank you. All right, have a good night. See you, Miguel. See you, Ling. See you, Natalia. See you. Thanks.